you have quite a list of scores, but you've got a huge list of orchestrations. Yes. And I, I'm not sure I'm really clear how, what's the difference? The huge, the huge difference. Yeah. The composer writes, writes the music and um, usually has to d deal with the director. He's writing music for a film, so there are limitations and, and that whole emotional and uh, kind of skills. An orchestrator takes what the composer writes and makes it sound like what the composer thinks he wrote, okay? Because often, you know... With instrumentation yeah, and stuff like that? Back then, it was, um, Dan was banging on the piano, and he, he would write out sketches, you know, thinking he'd want, you know, the strings to do this and the brass to do this, and, and I would be going, well, the brass, this should be French horns, this should be trombones, and we'll voice it this way and make sure that... Um, it's heard in the orchestra and oh this part of the movie it's got to be really soft because there's lots of dialogue and and so it was kind of my responsibility to to make sure it's shaped right for the film also besides being playable by the orchestra mm -hmm. since that early time to now now Danny does uh, and most composers have to do full mock-ups so the directors can hear you know synthesizers basically and samplers playing what they're gonna get so that when we get to the scoring stage there are no, no big surprises. But if the director and the composer are not in concord with each other, mm -hmm. when they get to the scoring stage, it could be a disaster that the composer's written something that the Completely director... Completely different ...different visions. than what, what the director thought he was getting. And, and then you waste a lot of money and a lot of time right. either trying to bang it in together or you cancel and you know start right. over. And it's, so, that's a, so it's a good thing. But the bad thing is that composers, even composers who are... Um, um, very orchestration and uh, musical literature literate don't have time to do all the work themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, even John Williams, who does you know great sketches and stuff, doesn't do the orchestration. He's got a, a team of orchestrators who make sure it works so that he's still composing and all that other work is getting done. Uh, okay. um, so an orchestrator... Ha the biggest function is making sure that the, the composer's vision is realized. And the second is that it all all works with the orchestra, and you don't waste time on the in the recording process. And the third one that I kind of, um, as a head orchestrator, I, I, it ended up that I always have two or three people working, on, is to make sure that it's all organized, that we have the right players at the right time, that we have the right cues to record. If usually so, uh, Sometimes there are restrictions as to how we can record. Um, sometimes we're following the dub by a day, so we have to make sure and record the first reel so that they'll have it mixed and on the dubbing stage in time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's more that we can do it by theme. It's like if he's written the romantic theme, we can have a day that's like all the romantic theme and have just the orchestra we need for the romantic theme kind of deal, which then saves money. Because if you have to do the romantic theme and the big um, fight scene, uh, on the same day, then sometimes they're not quite the same orchestra. So, uh, anyway, I digress. But sometimes the orchestra, the, the orchestrator's job is to make sure it's all. It all, go, it all goes, goes well. together, yeah. together seamlessly. Right. You still do uh, work with Danny Elfman? Quite yes. A bit? Yeah, we just finished a movie called Wanted. Mm -hmm. um, we recorded at Fox, had a, a, a decent sized orchestra, and we, they were under time limitations, both because of Danny and because of uh, their budget and uh, we got it all done nice and quick and, and uh, efficiently. Outside of everything else you're doing, you're also record producing? That was a real left turn for me. Um, I got approached by, um, I'd, I'd gone and see, seen Rhea play a few times and uh, she slowly sneakily like said, well you want to play on my record? And it was, oh you want to Produce my record? <laughs> and I go, it, ah. And when I th finally, I mean, I, I was like really, like, I, you know, I hadn't produced a record since I did one record after the Boingo mm -hmm. days. And uh, so I hadn't done anything for know, 10 years, maybe. And I thought, ah, well, well, you know, I don't want to get involved in that. Yeah. But when she sat down, there were, there were two songs that, that she played for me that just knocked me out that uh, made me want to do the project. The, the most important was um, Joy Spring. She had this completely out and different take on how to do this. It's like a fast bebop tune. And she did it as kind of this like slow, sexy, 
mechanical but but emotional kind of it just it not it knocked me out what she wanted to do with this tune that it was taking it someplace completely different and then i looked at her uh, her repertoire as we went through her her songs and realized that well that's kind of what she's doing with everything is um so because of what i um assessed as uh, as her talent her mm -hmm. creative force that i thought well i, you know, I want to be involved with this so something new and exciting yeah and so I, it's not that i'm looking for a career as a record producer but it was a really great experience. I met a lot of great musicians, and, and so it kind of keeps you plugged into the contemporary music scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 it reconnected me with um, studio. You know, I mean, I, I I do stuff here and I do stuff on a big scale, but it reconnected me with the old band mm -hmm. feeling. So tell me, Steve, what would you do if you weren't doing music? Um, I'd probably be sleeping a whole lot. <laughs> I, I can't imagine not doing music, unfortunately. Yeah. Because, you know, I have trouble finding a hobby because my hobby becomes some other part of music. Yeah. So I've been very lucky. Um, yeah. Things that I've always managed to make a living doing music, which is... Something you love. Yeah. Which is great. It's, it's just very... From all my friends that don't do music or don't do something that they really love, I feel completely blessed and lucky. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for uh, being on Interview World. <laughs> My pleasure. Great job. <laughs> Do a good job of editing it, though. <laughs>